So we've started recording now. So yeah, um, we may as well get started. So you're all very welcome. Thank you very much to come, for coming along to the Dublin Data Science Workshop Series. Um, you know, basically Dublin Data Science is a meetup group that's been going on since, uh, in this particular incarnation since 2017, but most of the organizers have been on the meetup scene since about 2013. Um, you know, we try and give talks very generically once a month. Um, obviously with the pandemic that everything came to a screeching halt about 15 months ago. So we still have, we try to still do monthly events. Sometimes it's me doing a workshop. Uh, every so often we get speakers. Um, I am hoping to have a speaker for next month, which will be June. Uh, I don't want to say that specifically. We, we kind of agreed to do it in June, but we didn't agree a date. So there is some specifics to be organized. Um, I'm, it's a topic I'm particularly looking forward to, but I don't really want to promise anything We'll definitely have the speaker. It's just there is an outside chance it won't be in June, but I imagine it will be. So we rather than have the workshop in June, we will just have a talk, which will be on on um, Dogpatch Labs um, host online through Crowdcast. So we'll do it there. And uh, yeah, it will be a talk. And then probably normal service will be resumed in July, where I, I, after this one, I'm not sure. I'm thinking there's going to be two more. This has gone a little bit longer than I expected, but that's OK. Because for those of you who are new, and I noticed that we have a couple of people in the chat which are brand new, um, was so I've been running workshops as part of meetups for quite a few years, and I and I tried to make them a bit more um, specific and like workshoppy in terms of practical stuff. Whereas when we give talks, they tend to be a bit more generic with slides and you know a higher level kind of presentation. Still have discussions and stuff, but you know, a bit more kind of presentation. Whereas a workshop, I try to be very specific. So I will teach the basic theory rather than just gloss over it. And we try and like, I'd rather actually cover less, but cover it in depth so that people actually come away with an idea of what, what the topic is rather than, you know, stick it at a very high level. And all you really understand is that you now have something to Google. Uh, I try to get a little bit more in depth than that as a result of these workshops. So the workshops tend to be very, a notebook focused as opposed to slides, for example. So one of the ideas, um, and we do, on, I have a bunch of stuff. If you look at my GitHub repo, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. I'm sure most of you are familiar with them. Um, but this series is, a, one thing I, I have noticed is a gap is, no one ever really talks about the practical realities of doing a data science project, like, or some kind of data related project, because that word also gets pretty misused. And in my experience, most of the work in a project is in the data, like loading, finding it, cleaning it, manipulating it, processing it into a form amenable for analysis, figuring out what's in there, checking if there's any errors, checking you know if there's weird data export issues, all that kind of stuff. And there was no real, no one really covered that very practical stuff. And to be fair, it's very, it's a difficult thing to do in the abstract because you know every is different and they all have their own quirks. That require their own way to kind of you know solve these problems so i thought well the best way to do it is actually do over a workshop series where we have time is do a long series and it was something i've been pl planning to do for ages and then obviously um covid19 hit at the pretty much like what 14 months ago 15 months ago and we had the lockdown in the middle of march and you know we did we kind of didn't really do much for very long and then i had the idea well this is a perfect opportunity opportunity to kind of do it and then people ask me about recording it so we put it all up on YouTube but the idea is that from soup to nuts is an old English saying um, for a full meal you started with the soup and you ended with the nuts as part of the dessert so soup to nuts is kind of means from start to finish um, so like the, the, the full process so the plan has been exactly that we have started at the very start like essentially three workshops ago just look taking some data figuring out how we're going to download it, what we're going to do with it, some ins and outs of, you know, problems with things that we would have seen. Then we spent basically the second workshop, and that actually, believe it or not, pretty much got us to the end of the first workshop, because there was quite a bit even in that, just things like getting the data, figuring out what's in there, making sure it loads up, all that sort of stuff, not even really doing any exploration on it, just making sure the data makes sense. And, you know, there's quite a bit of work in that, uh, regardless of how clean the data is. 
and then the, the the second workshop we kind of focused on data exploration a bit more obvious and i i kind of this is kind of a bugbear of mine for those of you who know me you'll probably be smiling to yourself going oh here's mick banging the drum again but i really do believe that a, a, a vastly underappreciated aspect of this is data loading and data manipulation and data exploration and vision to me most of the work is actually in that part of the project because the libraries and things like scikit-learn and the various R tools and all the other like machine learning things you can get in the various packages of your choice now that part of it has now been so made so simple it's almost trivial to do so that the expertise is kind of in getting the data to a point where you can actually build an effective model but then also knowing what to do afterwards if you know what i mean so and that's where all the work is and that's where that's not something i don't think can be automated very well certainly not at the current levels of technology so yeah so that's basically kind of where we're um where we're going with all this so that's what i wanted to find i like i said that's pretty much took over not just workshop two but i ended up spending half of last workshop on it as well because it kind of tied into a lot of stuff for the third workshop then um we we started doing a bit more exploration and then kind of looking at some of the the looking at the data and kind of going back and fixing it because this is kind of an iterative process so i realized i had some issues with the data uh, and we kind of went back and started talking about it for example this is basic and i'll talk about this in a sec this is kind of a transactional data set from an e-commerce e website uh, and that had some certain quirks with it and then in the third workshop basically we actually started doing some modeling uh, and the modeling was things like there was a couple of things we could do with this um we have a book because what I found in most projects you're working on is it's very, very rare to have a project where you have a very specific approach prescribed at the start. You generally have someone who has, you know, if, if you're lucky, they will have a strong idea of what they want. Most of the time, they don't even have that. They just want, you know, they'll have very high level questions that they like, you know, you know who are our most valuable customers or um you know which is how likely are we to have this process fall over in the next year and oh you know there's all sorts of different applications you can have so one of the things i kind of wanted to point out was once we've got the data in reasonable shape and we're in a position where we're reasonably happy with the data to be able to work on it uh, what I wanted to do then was try a bunch of things. Like, let's try a, a few different things that we could do. So, for example, we could go down the. Um, oh, sorry, you don't mind muting? Oh, I'll just mute you. I'll just mute everyone. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, that was some pretty good cool music, though. Actually, in fairness, whoever that person is, it's like yeah, it was pretty eighties tastic. Um, so. Where was I? I've kind of lost my train of thought here. Um, so yeah, so you don't really know what you're going to do. You, 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 um, what I tend to do is I get some data. I'm going to try a bunch of things. So one thing up, for example, on the top of my head, and that's mainly because it's my background. Time series analysis struck me as an immediate thing to look at. Uh, how would it be relevant? Well, you could lose it from the point of view of maybe total sales per day or per week or per month and just use it to track, or you could do it for some kind of forecasting. So like if you, you know, you've got two or three years worth of sale data and you're trying to forecast revenue for the next couple of years, or or at least, you know, what the, what the, you know, the seasonality and all that and how big it is, those are all things we could do with modeling. So time series is one thing, and I have some um, explorations of the time series in there. The other two things that really stood out was, because again, it's a retail data set from some kind of like Etsy style workshop, from what I can tell, um, that is selling kind of, you know, you can see it there like Christmas lights and pillowcases and various things. It's, it's not particularly well described in the data uh, what the exact source is, presumably because it was based on some kind of academic paper. So, normally in reality of course we would have a bit more domain knowledge so in this case i had to kind of make some stuff up to be to be quite blunt and um kind of i made a few assumptions about things but it also meant i could kind of self-direct what we wanted to do with the project kind of where we've kind of gone with it so the other two things that really struck out was um 
as well as I looked at some time series, I had a little look at some graph stuff. But the two things that really stood out were with customer lifetime value, an obvious one to, to look at is things like um, in, for estimating that there's, there's these models called buy till you die, which is by a guy called Peter Fader. And it's the idea is it's, it's a way of modeling customer behavior in a, what's called a non-contractual setting. So like an e-commerce website where the person who is the customer does not have a contractual obligation to, to like pay you money. So it's not like a subscription service like Netflix or life insurance policy or car insurance policy or you know, a, a utility bill or some kind of like, you know, um, magazine subscription. It's, it's not in that situation because in that you can also do these kind of customer lifetime things, but the, the nature of the data is such that you use different techniques. For this case, like if, if uh, to give an example, if you have a customer buying you from the website, you have absolutely no idea if that person has no intention of coming to you again and ever using you again as a customer, or maybe they just will come back in a year's time or in two years time or in three months time. And you, you have no way of knowing that. So it's a very kind of different environment, which requires a different set of both modeling assumptions and modeling approaches to do that. So I thought I've always, I've kind of heard about these for a few years now, and I'd heard they'd be used quite successfully by a couple of companies in Ireland. Um, and you know, I've gone to some talks about them. And I thought that was quite interesting. And it was basically one of the reasons why I do these workshops and I pick something is because I also get to learn as well. That's kind of my incentive to keep doing these workshops is that way I get something out of it. So, you know, rather than just be randomly teaching the same old stuff and getting bored, it's inevitably I'd stop by forcing me to give workshops. I kind of learn these things. So I thought, great, let's learn some by till you die. And then the other one was association rules, which is kind of basket analysis. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and that's association rules are kind of like the classic kind of first use of machine learning in e-commerce that people talk about. It was the based on like uh, it's the classic thing of, you know, the beer and diapers thing that you hear about or the various kind of scary um, overuse of AI where Target in America, I think, basically started sending a young woman baby like stuff out of the blue and uh the her father basically rang up target and gave out yards and then called back a week or two later and the great phrase it was clearly quite a you know quite a religious man and he was like there's been activities going on in my house that i was unaware of and i'd just like to give an apology and it turns out his teenage daughter was pregnant and they had identified that through the changes in her buying patterns and that was a bit creepy and people started to go and this was all before the whole Cambridge Analytica thing blew up so which again I mean we can talk about another day I'm not I think I mentioned this the last time I'm not entirely convinced that was as uh as powerful as people say it was but that's kind of a conversation for another day um so yeah so basically we have this data it's a whole lot of transactional data uh we've done some exploration on it like I mentioned before um and I'm going to go very quickly through the exploration just to give people a sense of what's in there and kind of the things I've added to it. So it came in an Excel file. The very first lesson I learned from this, as I'm sure if any of you see the, the videos from before, was that it was an Excel file and I didn't open it in Excel. Because I, I hate spreadsheets. I never use them and I don't need them. I should just open them in R or Python or whatever. They have a read Excel function. And why would I be open them in Excel? And of course, the reason why you open them in Excel is because it's the native format of that. And I didn't realize it had two bloody spreadsheets in it. There was two worksheets in the file so that I loaded up half the data and didn't realize it until kind of, you know, a week or two into the project. When at one point I just looked at the website where I got the data from, which is the this uh, UCI machine learning. Actually, while I'm there, it's the UCI uh, machine learning repository, which is a great online website uh, for a whole load of kind of machine learning data sets. In fact, let's just have a quick type because I'm only 20 past seven. As I did, I did warn you all I can talk a lot. So I'm, I, you know, I'm not really going to apologize for that. Um, so in here, there's a whole load of interesting data sets. So the one I was looking through was online retail and there's online retail one and two. So the one I used was the second one because it was a bit more recent. The other one was from 2015. So the first thing I should have done, and this is the thing I didn't do, 
was look at this number here and notice that there was a million instances. And then after a little while, I noticed I only had half a million instances. And then I was like, eh? And then I realized I was working with an Excel file. So I should, probably should have looked at the Excel file and noticed there was two tabs down the bottom. It jumped out at me immediately. Now there is ways of dealing with that in, in, in R and in Python, where you can read in the number of worksheets and you know read data from the work and all that. That is very true and you could do that or you could just open the bloody thing in Excel first and see why it was there. So, you know, I'm not, or, or I have LibreOffice or something. In fact, I don't have installed on this machine because I recently re reinstalled Windows. Um, you know, just open it in its native format and just do some really simple sanity checks, like, like check the number of instances. And obviously this was pretty stupid on my behalf, but what you're trying to do is, is prevent yourself from being stupid as much as possible because you'll always get weird things that'll happen to so checking the number of columns and checking the number of rows it's really really simple thing to do and you know it's easy to not bother doing it because how did it find out but it will actually save you from making big mistakes because quite often you'll find for example that you know if you're working on a, a job like a data project at work and it's a dump from a sql database sometimes those sql dumps are malformed and they produce nonsense or there's weird characters in some of the fields that creates broken characters so when you read it in the the the, the, the file gets read in in a in a where the computer conveniently tried to interpret the data for you instead of failing noisily and as a result you've got bad data and you'll end up with like far too many columns or not enough columns or not enough rows or whatever it is like that to you know, so do all these very basic checks. And that's basically what I do there. I, I kind of, in this, it's based on a template I have. There's a much better package that I recommend people use called Data Explorer. I will, and again, oh, the other thing I should mention is all this work is in R because that's pretty much what I work in. Um, however, as much as possible, I try to talk about generic concepts as opposed to R implementations. Uh, and I know for those Pythonistas out there, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, especially today, like all the data manipulation, all that, that's very easy to do in Pandas. I'm not as certain about association rules in Python. Uh, I'm sure they are because there's been a lot of like development work in the last few years. Um, if anyone knows of them, please let me know in the chat. I'll, ha I'll, I'll happily publicize it. Uh, but I do all my work in R, so that's the one I kind of know. Um, but I, having said that, I do, I'm much more interested in general concepts than the specific use of libraries because, you know, the specific use of libraries in particularly interesting. What I care about is what I'm actually doing and why I'm doing it. So I'm going to try and keep it as high a level as possible as opposed to the specifics of, of the use of R. So we, we go through the data and, you know, your checks here, like I said, I forgot to check that it was all in there. There is some weird quirks in the data, like it's two tabs but there was some date overlaps between them. So the end of the first tab and the start of the second tab, I think had a few days in December overlapping. So they were duplicated in the data set. So I, um, you know, we account for that and I added a bunch of things, but the basic data is very, very simple. There's a sheet here that I added myself, but there's an invoice ID, a stock code, which is, you know, the specific item that's been bought, the description, which is like a free text field of what the stock code is, how many were bought, what price they were bought at, what the date of the invoice was, and then what the customer ID was and what country that person was. So a very, very simple set of transactional data. However, there was a bunch of uh, issues that came up in like, um, well, one thing to check was, you know, have stock codes been reused? That was a great, I actually got that as a suggestion from, uh, one of the audience members in on the first week as in like you know did they did they loop around and have something that was an item at one point in time but it meant something completely different at a different point in time so you kind of have to add a time-based thing to it too uh, luckily there was none of that there was because this is kind of free form the description field sometimes was not unique to a specific stock code but it was usually kind of like a rearranging of the words rather than referring to a different thing. So for example, just uh, it's not in this, but like there might've been a case where this stock code was repeated, but rather than the, being this 15 centimeter Christmas glass ball, 20 lights, it might be like 20 times 15 centimeter glass balls. 
Christmas. You know, so basically when you looked at most of them, um, I was pretty confident. And I, and I do that in there. I do some checking in there. I did look at making sure that, you know, all that data was essentially clean. There was a bunch of other things in there as well, though, like returns are in there and there's no less uh, like there's negative quantities and the returns aren't linked to an initial purchase. So I had to do a bit of work around doing that. That's actually a much bigger job than I thought it was. So I kind of abandoned it for now mainly because um, I got a I got a quick and dirty version of it working. And then at that point, getting it more accurate, the question was, was the juice worth the squeeze? And while it may be for this point of view, I didn't want to go down a rabbit hole. So I kind of did a quick and dirty matching thing where I would match a return against uh, an invoice. So we kind of have a certain returns thing. Um, but, you know, for the purposes of this, I've kind of ignored all that. Uh, for now, that's something we will probably go back to a bit later, simply because returns are very important, especially in online retail. Um, one of the things I have heard are that um, th there have been a bunch of cases of online retail companies where their returns policy have actually killed their profitability. So they do, they're doing very, very well and they're selling a lot, but they have a high enough returns that the cost, basically not only do you refund the paper, the, the, the money but you and also the stock but don't forget you've also got to spend shipping costs there and shipping costs back if you pay for that yourself like like what amazon do and in that case if you don't manage that properly that can absolutely kill your profitability and i have heard that is a big issue so i don't want to ignore returns completely um although to confess my sins i haven't really done much with it here and all I've really done is kind of ignore them for now because they haven't been particularly important so far. They may become more important for next next one when we talk a bit more about customer lifetime value. Um, I might use them, but in here I didn't bother because I was just trying to get association rules. And at this point, the fact that someone bought them is probably not that relevant to whether or not they got returned. So this is a very kind of longer term, like clustering kind of idea. So that's kind of where I wanted to go. So we did all that. We did a bunch of cleaning. Uh, we created some drive variables, did some basic checks, like I said. Oh, I had a little, these were all kind of laid off because I the, the output here, I use our markdown for all this. And the output format is a thing called uh, mark the down, which is part of the RMD formats package. And there was a bit of Java uh, CSS that was a bit messed up, which is why these data tables, uh, this is JavaScript data tables. There's a package called DT that creates them and they were all messed up last month. So I figured out a way to fix that. So if any are interested in that, um, that, that interaction, I think it's going to be fixed shortly in our markdown in RMD formats. But yeah, there's a little bit where you can add CSS to the, to the file. Excuse me. So we did all that. And then, you know, we do all our univariate plots. We look at missing data. We talked about this a lot more. I'm not going to really go into it now. We did some very quick, um, you know, univariate plots, log scale, non-log scale, I won't bother. And then we looked into some custom expirations where we look at a whole bunch of different things. And again, just checking to see invoice amount, what's the customer spend? Is there a tail value in there? This is the stock code investigation I mentioned. Yeah, you can get all these weird things like .com postage and Amazon gift cards and there's returns. There was also bank fees in there. There was a whole, um, oh, thank you. Uh, oh, there's a link there in, oh, I will, this is someone sent me market basket analysis in Python. Uh, like I said, if, if uh, thank you, uh, uh, market basket, now, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff there from a quick analysis. So for the, any who want to do Python, um, I'm sure I haven't looked at that, but let me just, uh, I'll, I'll post it in the chat, uh, send it to everyone. There we go, for anyone who's interested. Oops, there's my. Okay, so yeah, so you had a whole lot of crap like this, which was very interesting. And under normal circumstances, I would find this quite curious and I would probably incorporate this into the analysis. But that would be making the assumption that I had access to the stakeholders who could explain some of this to me. And absent of that, I just threw it all out because I'm not really sure how like um, 
comprehensive it is. Like there's postage in there and discounts and there's all sorts of weird stuff in here. And because I don't really have a good access to what was actually going on, I thought I'm just going to throw it out because it just, it could be useful. It might not be useful, but it's definitely going to make things a lot more complicated to implement. And I'm not entirely sure it's going to be like directly relevant to the kinds of analysis I'm doing. So I'm just going to ignore it for now. And that, again, that would be something that you would probably have to tease out with various stakeholders when you're trying to figure out what you need to do. And we're doing a whole bunch of analysis, some time series data where we aggregate, you know, and this will be useful for projection. Like in particular, I thought interesting that it's, you know, they both look pretty similar across two years. We actually haven't really had much sales growth month on month. You know, obviously very seasonal around Christmas, but, you know, we're not seeing an upward trend or a downward trend. I thought that was curious. The data only covers two years, as you can probably see. Um, so maybe it's a bit unfair to kind of give, um, to put too much credence on kind of longer term trends when you've only got two years. Um, and it was 2010, 2011, which was quite a different regime for online retail. Also, it was closed at like the weekends and for 10 days over Christmas, which I thought was a bit odd considering it was an online re shop because I would have expected that even if they don't necessarily fulfill the orders, because I know a few people who do online retail and while the, but the website's always up, I would have thought, and then they would fulfill the, re the orders like, you know, once the holidays are over. There was just no transactions whatsoever. So I thought that was a bit curious. And I'd be curious to know the, you know, the origin of some of this data, but I'm, I'm not sure we ever will. Some calendar-based box pots, like I said, just really simple plots of various purchases. There's all sorts in there. I, I'm not going to, the, I did a quick check of, this is the stock code and just checking to see, you know, how are they unique or is there multiple ones? You can see like here, I put them with a space and a colon. So there was this was a check and then groovy cactus infl inflatable. I uh, don't really know, but that's all these names are kind of weird like this. And there's no other classification of them either. That And that's one thing that becomes a problem a little bit later in that it would be handier if we had some kind of product hierarchy that we could layer onto this data, because I think that would allow us to be a bit more insightful in terms of what we do. We could even potentially collapse things down uh, and like, for example, um, yeah, you can see here like army camo wrapping tape, spots on red book cover tape, army camo book cover tape. So when you've got different colors of the same thing, some they have different, they often have very different stock codes. So they'll have all sorts of like different things, um, which I thought was a bit kind of odd. And it would be nice if you could have, if you could kind of have that. It's this is the same thing, but then have different colors. And it, to be able to have that hierarchy would have been nice but anyway we don't so there's no point about it and that was kind of you know we did a whole bunch of stuff and you know that got us to the point so now we're kind of asking the questions okay well what do we want to do so like i said there was a couple of things we looked at and the two main ones that stand out for me are association rules which is basically where it's like the co-occurrence of baskets so if you've got an item and then buying one item effectively out of you buying another item and the idea is it got used for things like, you know, customer loyalty or um, price um, offers or, you know, oh, you bought this, maybe you like that, that sort of stuff. It can be used to feed in all that. And I think in general, it's kind of an interesting thing to look at. It's, so there and uh, the other thing that a friend of mine who used them in the past has said is a big, a big advantage of association rules, excuse me one sec, is that they are simple. Like people understand them. Um, the downside, like as in you can explain them to even the most non-technical of people and they will understand the basic concepts of what association rules do. They might not understand, you know, the underlying technology about how they're discovered, but they understand, they kind of grok the concept, which is an advantage that you should not underestimate because the one thing, it's a great way of building trust if people feel like they understand what the hell you're talking about. So association rules are really useful for that. The other thing I've discovered about them, like I said, is they can actually, because it's effectively, a, it's an unsupervised learning technique or unsuit like clustering, uh, they've actually been used for non, for other areas. It's it's not just for kind of basket analysis. They're in the, in one of the examples on, on the A rules package, which is the kind of the main package for using this in R, 
they used census data. So they were getting like essentially using it to cluster different types of people in the cluster. So as long as you've got category and if you've got continuous data, it doesn't really work. So you have to discretize them. So you put them into buckets and then you use those kind of discretized levels. But uh, I thought that was quite interesting. That's something I'm definitely going to file away for future use because I can think of a few places in which it might be worth looking at association rules just in general, even if it's not really online retail, it's something else entirely. So I thought, oh, that's, it. and one thing I do like to have is, it's, I found it's handy to have like a basic understanding of a bunch of different techniques, because the worst thing you can do is just start applying default approaches to problems, because quite often it won't necessarily fit and you won't get good answers and you certainly won't get great, you know, you won't get items that will have an impact outputs that have an impact and that can you can end up your credibility and all them get questions so it's it's nice to have multiple strings in the bowl so we've we've gotten to the point now where we're ready to use association rules so i went over these very briefly uh last month and i kind of talked about these in a kind of a at a relatively high level because i was kind of covering the different ideas so what i'm going to do today is talk a bit now it's about 20 days so that's great i'm going to talk a bit introduce the idea um, it's about it's about 20 to 8 rather than take a break early what i'll probably do is go until maybe about eight o'clock and then we'll take a break so what i'd like to do now is essentially introduce the idea explain what's going on under the hood and then just talk about how they're done and and what you can do about it and then most importantly probably after the break how do you use the outputs and and, and what do you do with that okay so before we go on does anyone have any questions i've been talking motor mouthing here for about 40 minutes. Does anyone have any questions? I'm just keeping an eye in the chat or feel free to unmute before I go on. Um, I'm conscious a couple of you are new, so you're not necessarily particularly familiar uh, with the project as, as it was worked on. Does anyone have any questions before we start? I'll, I'll give you like 10 or 15 seconds to type something or unmute and ask, but I'm going to assume not. No. Okay. All right. God, you're a quick mix. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> sure, Patrick. I was just going to ask. Um, I better see who who it is. Yeah. Um, I'm worrying about the kind of structured data that this is suitable for, um, and in particular, the thing that's always in my mind because of my other work is yeah. sur survey analysis yeah. where, where, we, where we say is there an association between people who are male and people who like a certain flavor of ice cream for, for argument's sake so um um for, how does the data have to be uh, structured for this to be possible it's, it's simply uh more as, as you have a free of a field for uh, the the item and yeah. not a field for the, the category of, of person that they are, and you see, is there some yes. association between so those two? I, I, so you've got me off the spot here, because like I said, this is something that, just, but my understanding is the way they treat it is, if you've got a survey, surveys will be perfect because everything's essentially categorical by default. Um, so surveys are fine. You don't really have to do any jiggery pokery. Making the assumption you're using, if you've got some kind of, ordinality it's an ordinal scale rather than a direct measure so you've got like or, or something but let's assume it's like so you know like how do you on a scale of one to five how strongly do you agree with this statement kind of stuff rather than actual measurements and you know you know so everything kind of gets categorized my understanding for this now i will i i don't know for certain patrick but what i will do is i'll go away and this and i will maybe talk about it at the next workshop but mm. my understanding That's is very good way, yeah, not at all, because I'm curious myself, and that's a good question. My understanding is all that data is fine because what it does is it treats a single row as a basket. So just to explain this, basically, the way association rules work is, um, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail, it looks at a transaction, and a transaction is like when you go into the shop, it's all the items in the basket that you buy in a single purchase and what gets bought together. and you know, obviously for that, that kind of situation, um, th the baskets can be variable length. So, you know, you could buy, have one item in a basket or two, or you could have 10, or you could have 50, depending on how many, you know, like an Amazon order, 
I might wait up and buy like 10 things all at once, or sometimes I'll just buy two or three things. You know, it kind of varies. And Whereas, the equivalent, the equivalent well, of a survey could, could be a, a multiple choice question where somebody picks yeah. this and, and this and, and that's, this. Yes. So yeah. it, isn't, it isn't a category in the sense of being, uh, you, you can only pick one of a yeah. single choice, but you can have m multiple ch choices. So in that case, you kind so, of won't hot encode it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. you'd have yes right. to this, yes to this, no to that, no to that. Yeah. So my yeah. understanding of how it works with association rules for like survey data is you treat the row as a basket. And then all the elements in the back, the values of the basket are like your items. And then it's how do those values all co-occur to one another kind of like they would in a in a basket so i'll tell you what it's pro it'll probably make a bit more sense at the break once i've kind of explained these ideas and then maybe we'll discuss that like uh in about 15 20 minutes once we've taken a break let everyone go grab a cup of tea okay so we've got association rules so basically um, we need to, oh, the, here's the one thing. I work in the tidyverse in R, but one of the problems I found with some of these packages are a bit old and they use base R and sometimes the code is horrible. Um, and that is definitely, it's a problem with, but it's not as big a problem for association rules. It is a bit of a problem for buy till you die, which we'll talk about next month. Um, but anyway, that's so I've had to do a little bit of jiggery pokery, but basically what I couldn't do was, what I'm doing here is, and this is something you will find, and this is a generic thing, is sometimes you have to do a bit of data, data manipulation to get the data in the format of the package that you're going to use. And while it's a pain in the arse, do it. Because the one thing I will say about the joys I have of using packages, especially for this kind of work, is that they probably know more about it than you do. So don't reinvent the wheel conform to whatever they need to do unless it's completely ridiculous in which case it might be easier to do it yourself but in general it's worth kind of bending over and that was a mistake i used to make in the past where i don't need my own linear solver i'm going to write my own and that way i can get it to work exactly the way i wanted to and of course that was a terrible terrible idea what i really should have done was just use all those standard libraries and worked around getting the data into the format that all these libraries wanted to be in so this is basically what happens here i had to do a little bit of jiggery pokery with the purchase data, write it out as a CSV, and then read it, read, use the CSV for A rules to read it back in. So it could read all the transaction data in. So basically each, the way it works is you have a trans, which is basically a collection of items. And then within those, within those transactions, you have all these individual items. Now from a basket point of view, you don't care as much about the price of the item, or the quantity of the item, uh, at least on the basic versions that I know, there may be some extensions to the model. All you're really occurring is present or not present. So like, did, was this item purchased with this item and vice versa? And that's all you really care about. So all I'm putting in there is I'm reading in my transactions in basket and I had to put in format single because each role, there's two ways in which that data can be listed. It could be like a single line separated by commas or bars or whatever kind of delimiter you need. So each transaction is in a single row, or you can have it in a long format where, you know, you give each transaction a transaction ID and then the, the stock code items are together. And that was the way I did it because that was kind of the way the data was formatted for me. So just looking at that, there's a bunch of things we've kind of already done, but I thought we may as well look at it. What's the relative frequency of different items? So it's just, you know, there's a, some of these come as part of the package. So you can see this particular item, 85123A, is in over 12% of the baskets. So it's I actually, I don't know if I've done it there, but I absolutely should have gone in there and just looked and see what those items are. Oh, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, oh, wait, no, I didn't. Oh, because I've arranged by stop code. Um, I probably should have sorted by that. Let me have a quick look. How many do we have? So this is a nice little thing called data table. So yeah, so we have this 852, what is it, 85123A. So it's this bottom one here. White hanging heart tea light holder. Cream hanging heart tea light holder. So that is the most common item bought on the website. So I thought that was kind of weird. But anyway, I, like I said, one of the issues I have here is I don't really understand the data as much as I would want to if I was doing this for real. Uh, you know, I tend to ask a lot of questions at the start 
and keep asking them because that's how you kind of understand this stuff. So yeah, so this particular tea light holder was like you know percent of the of the transactions, which is okay, fair enough. Not going to question that. So the basic idea what we're trying to do now is uh, basic idea of probability theory. So essentially, what association rules are looking for are conditional probabilities, and those probabilities are basically the probability of appearing in in a basket versus the probability of appearing in a basket given that something else is in the basket. And essentially, you know, you have your basic probability of appearing, which is just how often does it appear in a basket at all? What's like the unconditional probability? And then we look at, given that this item is hid, now what's the conditional probability of it appearing? And that becomes the, the new value. And then divide one by the other and you get the lift. So that's kind of the high level value. So you can look here, you, we define the support. So let's say, for example, we have um, an item set. So it's a collection of one or more items that co-occur in a transaction. So we can look at it very here. Let's say these are our list of transactions. We have milk and bread, we have bread and butter, we have beer, we have milk, bread and butter, and we have bread and butter, right? So you could have an item set that's milk and bread, you could have an item set that's beer, so the support of an item set is defined as the proportion of transactions in the data set which contain that item set. So all those items have to be in it. And in the above example, the item set milk bread is in 40% of the transactions. So the support for milk and bread is 0.4. And the reason why is you can see it's in this one here, but it's also in this one here, even though it's also in with, with butter. So the item set of that, it's two out of five, so it's 40%. And then we have a rule, which is a directed relationship. And that, that directed is important because it's basically what you're conditioning on, for those of you who understand conditional probability. Um, so you're basically saying, what now is the, uh, the confidence? So it's defined as being the support of both of them divided by the support of the, I can't think of the name of it, the precedent, I think they call it, as opposed to the antecedent. So it's the thing that goes at the start. The arrow points away from it. So to calculate the co confidence for milk and bread implying butter, we think, okay, well, what's the support of X and Y? Well, we kind of said it was already 0.4. And then what's the confidence, the support of butter? So how often does butter appear up here? Uh, or, or all of them, sorry. And it appears in one. So it's one over five is 0.2. So the confidence of this is 0.2 over 0.4, which is 0.5. Hang on, butter appears in three of them. Yeah, but milk, bread, and butter, it's the combined. It's the support of X union Y. So it's how often, what's the proportion of all three occurring? And there's only one in which all three of them occur, that one there. Okay, thanks. So that's why it's point two. Yeah, I know. This is why I went over this, because it, it took me a little bit to get my head around it. So you're looking at the combined probability of, of the proportion of all of them appearing divided by the proportion of the left-hand side appearing. And that gives you the confidence of the rule, okay? And note that the rules are not symmetric. So the confidence of butter implying milk and bread is 0.2 over 0.6 because butter appears in three of them, right? So it's, it's, it's three over five, which is 0.6, which is the bottom, but the top hand is the same. So it's 0.2, so it's 0.2 over 0.6, so it's a third, so it's 0.33. Does everyone follow that? Okay. But that kind of makes sense, right? Because conditional probability isn't symmetric. So the probability of, you know, and that's something people always forget. Like, we always get that backwards. So, you know, if I am, you know, what is the likelihood of, uh, I'll have to pick something, off the top of my head. What is, the, you know, the probability of me being a professional footballer given that, sorry, the prom, let me, the, the pro probability of me playing in the men's English professional league, like the, the Premier League, given that I'm a man, is different to the probability of me being a man given that I play in the English professional Premier League. They're, 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 they're backwards and they're not the same thing. So this is the same idea here, that milk and bread, the confidence of milk and bread giving us butter is not the same as the confidence of butter 
implying milk and bread. Okay. But then we can get the relationship between the two, which is the lift. So we want to measure of the strength of the relationship between item sets X and Y. So that is measuring the effect of the presence of X on the presence of Y. So in other words, how much of an effect does this have on this? And that, that is symmetric. So it's just the support of X using Y divided by the support of X divided by the support of Y. And then we can do the calculation and we see it's 0.833. So lift values greater than one implies that the presence of X increases the probability of Y and compared to the condition. So in other words, we're more likely than, than not. Sorry, let me rephrase this. This is how we always get with. So let's just say there's a, there's, if we don't know anything, let's go back to the, the example we have in the data set here. This was like about in what, let's say 13% of baskets, this, it, these, these tea lights, right? So what we can say there is that there's a 0.13 probability of this particular item appearing in a basket, okay? However, if we know that something else is in the basket, that probability will move. It will no longer be 0.13, it might be 0.2, or it might be 0.5 or 0.8, or it could be 0.01. So the lift kind of indicates how much does that change due to the presence of this other item in here. And what association rules are trying to do is association rule mining is essentially doing a bunch of algorithms to try and draw out, calculate all those conditional probabilities. Now, the reason we hit the whole thing and brute force everything and just calculate everything. However, as you can imagine, that gets incredibly expensive, incredibly fast, because as you add more items, you just get this factorial expansion of all the possibilities. So you just get this combinatorial combinatorial explosion of possibilities and the whole thing just becomes unfeasible very very quickly because it's essentially exponential scaling so instead there's a couple of algorithms the a priori algorithm and the eclat algorithm which i don't really understand how it works and i don't particularly care but it's some kind of essentially heuristic method where it can kind of cleverly figure out where the, it uses some kind of co-occurrence and stuff. It looks at groupings. I'm not quite sure what it does, to be honest. It, it's briefly, it's mentioned in these papers, but then the, the vignettes kind of refer to other papers where these algorithms were kind of invented by academics and they refer to that. So they don't really explain um, the, the algorithms in the vignettes. And I, I don't think it's that important. The one thing I did find interesting though is, is there a difference between the two? So if I find rules on one side versus the other, do we see much of a difference? And certainly for, for the obvious ones, we don't. So at that point, I just didn't bother. Okay. So yeah, I hope I understood, made that. I'm, I'm very conscious. I probably didn't explain that as well as I did. But basically what we're trying to do is you're looking at proportions of one versus the other. And then what we're trying to figure out is you know, given that we have the presence of one of one item, how does that affect the likelihood of seeing this other item? Right. And what we're looking for then is which items have the biggest effect on each other. And those are the ones we want to look at, because they're the ones that clearly have a huge effect on whether or not this item is being purchased. And those things, basically what that means is these are items that tend to be bought together. Right. But it could also be interesting for maybe items that are less likely. To be like things that are have a massive negative lift or like you know a, a lift greater than one could be interesting too because you're looking at items that are never bought together and maybe you ask yourself why that is or does that make sense or maybe they're you know maybe they're it's like you know they're they're it's diet pills and and protein packs and stuff like that you know that they just don't really co-occur together so they're almost at cross purposes um but anyway yeah i think that is a good place to stop because it's now almost five, to, it's, we're closing in on eight o'clock. Before I do that though, does anyone have any questions about just the maths behind this? Now, we don't have to do these calculations. This is what libraries the calls do, but it's useful to have an understanding of like confidence, support and lift because they get reported by these algorithms and they're worth kind of looking at and having a sense of what they do. But um, yeah, before we go on to that, we will take a break. So when we come back, we'll look at 
basically, how do we actually mine out these rules? What are the things we need to think about? How do we how do we discover them? And then what do we do with the output once we have it? And that we'll we'll talk about the, that after the break. So before I take a quick break, I'll I'll give people maybe a minute or two. Does anyone have any questions for me before we come back at say we'll take a break now in a minute or two and we'll come back at say five past ten past eight? But I'd like to um um if anyone has any questions. See you, Patrick. Uh thanks for coming for joining us. Um but yes, if if uh Now's the time if you've got any questions. And uh, failing that, we will take a quick break and I'll see you back shortly. So I'll give people a minute. No, okay. All right, well, look, here's what we're gonna do. I am going to, I'll just turn off my screen. I'll put myself on mute. Uh, I'll keep the recording going though. Uh, this always just gets messy otherwise. Um, and I'm going to put myself on mute. If anyone has any questions, though, I'm just going to run and and uh, basically get make myself a cup of tea because it's handy for the walk for the uh, all the talking. But while I'm gone in the next five minutes or so, just pop them into the chat here, and I'll address them when I get back. Okay. All right. I'll see you back here in in about seven or eight minutes. About about five past. We'll come back.
Hello, I'm back. Um, admin, that is probably the best probability question everyone's ever asked me. However, I would love to take well calibrated answers and I will reveal it before. I'm going to leave as a result, as a tip, hat tip to admin. I'm going to uh, not turn my video on for a couple of minutes and I'll let people come up with their own probabilities. Ideally well calibrated though, remember, if you're going to have a probability, you know, ideally what you want it to be right. If you're going to say 0.4, then you want to be roughly right four times out of 10. That's the thing to remember. Okay. All right. So let me have a look. Any questions? All right. So Yash, so one simple question. How is this lift calculation different from something like naive Bayes? Uh, that is an excellent question. So naive Bayes is a bit different. Um, so naive Bayes is like a classifier where you're trying to classify a couple of different things. Um, and you know, you're making the idea that you're essentially, so the way the naivety comes in now, I'm not an expert on naive Bayes, I must say. Um, so I wouldn't like to, to be absolutely um, absolutist about this, but my, my understanding of naive Bayes is you're essentially making, you kind of do a Bayesian, you don't do a Bayesian calculation, but you use Bayes rule to calculate the probability of it having a value given the values of the inputs. And you, the naive comes in because you assume they're all independent of one another, that as in the all the inputs values don't co-occur and that it just makes the maths simpler. This, is a, this isn't quite the same thing. Um, first of all, it's, it's, the lift is not, it's like zero to infinity support. So your lift isn't a probability. So you don't have, you know, you don't have a bounded below by zero. You bound a below by zero, but it's not bounded above at one. It can be, and you will actually see in this data set, we end up with lifts of a couple of hundred because it's the ratio of two probabilities. So that is, or well, actually, no, it's not. It's the ratio of uh, a probability, two, well, proportions and then the product of two proportions. So it's not bounded at all. Um, it's a very direct, what, what, what you're doing is you're, you're not really modeling as such. It's actually very direct probability calculations. So you're essentially calculating empirical probabilities, essentially proportions in the data set. And then you're just using the basic you know, algebra of calculations to calculate them. Where, where the model and the algorithm comes in is the fact that, like I said, you have this combinatoric explosion to do it in a very naive way. Um, so you're rather than just calculating all the things and then getting the answer, that gets very expensive, especially if you have lots and lots of items. Instead, it uses some kind of exploration of the data to kind of tease out what those lifts are based on co-occurrence. I'm not quite sure how it works. I'm not quite sure if I answered your question, Yash. Uh, by all means, if you want to own and ask again, please do so and because, you know, hopefully that helped. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, no, no, no biscuits, no biscuits, just tea, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, happy with that answer, thanks. Yeah, so it's, it's naive base is actually more complicated than this. <laughs> yeah, okay. Even though this looks a bit, this is just straightforward applications of probability theory. Mm -hmm. It's just, you're doing basic conditional and unconditional probability cal calculations. And then the, the lift is basically the ratios of them. That's, all, that's the only difference, that's what it is. Yep, cool, thanks Mick. No problem at all, Yash. Okay, so yes. Um, sadly, no, uh, no biscuits. I'm, um, but I do have uh, Earl Grey, not Earl Grey, Lady Grey tea, which is very tasty. Okay. Um, all right, it's about ten past, so I'm getting ready to start back. Does anyone have any other questions before I get back to it? Okay. Good, good, good. Um, right. So, okay. So now what we're going to do is, well, obviously we're not going to calculate any of these. We're not going to figure out these association rules ourselves. I mean, we could write it ourselves in theory. And I, I think from what I understood, like to do it brute force will be a relatively easy thing to implement. 
you know, it would just take you ages and it probably would be incredibly unperformant. So instead, if we look at the A rules package, which is in R, which, and again, looking at that Python link that uh, Patrick found, I'm sure they do something similar. We have uh, the A rules on CRAM. So there's a CRAM, and then there's actually quite a good um, vignette with it that comes with this introduction to A rules, which kind of goes through, you know, the, like the example with the milk, bread and butter, I pretty much lifted directly from this. Um, you know, it goes through all the basics. It puts it into a bit more details than, you know, and it's, it's written in um, admin speak, unfortunately, or sorry, uh, academic speak. So I, it's a little bit too, um, it's a little bit dense for my liking. I think I'd rather a little bit more kind of user friendly, but it's still, it's pretty good. Um, and it goes through all the basics and some of the data structures that they use and all that kind of stuff. And they talk about what can be done and how, how, you know, how the data is laid out. And it goes through some of the basic ideas of, you know, what's in there. So it's, it's all of, uh, I use this and then there's a couple of other packages built on top of it, because like I said, association rules have been around for a long time and they're relatively simple to understand. And my understanding is that they're relatively easy to implement. So back in the day before you had libraries to do everything for you, when people had to like roll their own code, this, this was an, a simple, it was kind of a high bang for book kind of approach because you could just, you know, mine these out, get something of value. And it didn't, it wasn't like a years long project to kind of churn out these data. So, you know, that's basically what, so there's two packages in there. The one I mainly use is a priori, which basically, you know, digs all these out. But the two key things, the reason why I want to talk about it a little while is it needs a little bit of input data. So to do a priori, you, you have the basket A rules, which is basically all the transaction data that I had from before, which I think if I had the structure here, yeah, it's just the transaction data I wrote out. I put it into this basket to A rules object. So now when we're going to dig out with a priori, um, we just pass in all the transaction data and then we pass it a couple of parameters. So what we're saying here is that we want a minimum support of 0 0.005, so half of a percent. So in other words, the, the rules that we're talking about have to have occurred in at least half a percent of all of the transactions. So let's say there's a million, 1% is going to be 10,000. So these items have to have occurred in at least 5,000 transactions, which sounds like a lot, and we could make that lower, but I'm looking at the minimum confidence of 0.8. So we basically want the co-occurrence of these to be very strong, right? Now, that has great in that it's a very, very strong signal. However, the problem is that we'll see is, and we'll see this a little bit later, is that what it tends to do is tell you things you already knew, right? So, and that is one of the downsides to association rules from what people have told me, is that, you know, we've spent all this time and money and we've discovered that when people buy milk and bread, they also buy butter, right? Um, I don't recommend announcing that revelation to the stakeholders um, because their immediate reaction is going to be, well, yeah. Now, however, the other thing that is interesting to do is one thing I will say, and this is a common complaint, you know, you're, you're going to tell us things we already knew. The difference, I, the, the one counter that I always make to that is, yes, but you've been working in this industry for like, you know, you've had your business for 20 years. I've been working on this for a couple of days and look at what I've learned already just from the data talking to me. So there is a power in that as well. So even if you discover obvious things, it's still worth mentioning them if only as a sanity check and also as a as like a trust building exercise because in some cases when you're dealing with non-technical people they may be either intimidated or just suspicious in general of like the quote the computer is coming to take their jobs all right and everyone's been bombarded about that about how you know essentially you know the computers are coming and software is eating the world and there's an element of truth to that but most of it, I think, is overblown. I think what's happening is computers are getting rid of a lot of the really shit busy work unless we created ourselves, of course, which isn't to say that that won't happen. But a lot of the stuff is we're going to I think a lot of the things that are being done are things that are very automatable. 
and it's you know not necessarily low impact but stuff that are you know a computer should be doing anyway like all the you know the data processing and creating the re, you know formatting for the reports and all that kind of stuff that you really don't want a human doing anyway because it's it's completely boring mundane brain dead stuff and we just need to figure that you know how to automate that but what it can do is if you tell something that the stakeholders already know it almost brings you trust to then kind of let, hit them with the things they didn't know because at least they'll go well the things that discovered the things we knew already it's finding them but it's also finding these other things that we didn't know so that's why you know i i, I kind of started with this and i did toy about dropping it and i do drop it later on but i think it's worth kind of going through this simple exercise also because it means we find less rules i think in this one we're uh i think we find yeah there's a, a certain number of transactions and i I think yeah we find 423 rules so we discover 423 association rules as a result of these input parameters we would find more if we drop them but the counter to that is then the signal is weaker but the flip side of that is if the signal is weaker it's a lot less likely to have been noticed so one of the things i would probably play around with a bit is comparing association rules like and how you know if I start going to say 0.5 or 0.4 or 0.2, how many more rules do I get versus how many interesting things do I find? And that, again, that's not necessarily something you can automate. That's probably like, a, th there's an art to that more than a science. It's, it's, it's not a hard and fast thing. You're probably gonna have to kind of weigh that up for yourselves. So we've created this basket. We've created our association rules and I'm just doing a bunch of, like I said, these are kind of designed to work internally and I want to look at things like with my tables and stuff so I can plot them. So um, it creates all these rules. So you can see the rule is exactly what we would have thought. It's kind of a stock code pointing to another stock or a series of stock codes pointing to another one. And it gives us the support. So this is the support of the rule. In other words, how many do these occur in? We get the confidence level. So how often do all these co-occur? And you can see the confidence is very very high but we also get the lift which is basically the ratio of one to the other and you can see you're getting lifts here of 157 so in other words the condition the, the it's 157 times more likely to see item 22916 if it's bought these other two and you can see you see the way they're all con they're all incremental as well so this implies that essentially items of the same type are being bought at the same time now one interesting thing i will do is and I, it doesn't really work well with the markdown but in there is a thing called rule explorer which i thought was pretty cool and it's based on um it's based on shiny uh, i have no idea if there's a python equivalent um so i i can't help you on that front but what we can do is i'm just going to log back into our studio and um what we will do is i'm just going to invoke this rule explorer on oops on uh, basket a priori. So, cause it gives us a nice, oh, hold on, it's gonna do this. It gives us a nice little kind of investigation tool. So we've built, hold on, all of this is just loading up again. Ah, oh, crap, it restarted completely, didn't it? All right, so I've ran all this. Oh, hold on, let me just rerun this. Initial A rules. I've cached all this work, so it should this should run pretty quickly. But basically, what we're trying to do is uh, once I've kind of mined out the rules, so we'll have four hundred and twenty three rules. The tool that then will give us um, this like inspection of them. I'll I'll come back to that, and then we're just going to produce some plots. Some of these were already in Rule Explorer, and then there's this other thing called Eclat which is slightly different because it needs to, it's a two-step process. You've got to do rule induction. You pass it in, does a bunch of things. But basically I set it to the same thing and it mined out the same values. It gave us um, the 423 rules, I think. Yeah, and it, I did a quick check and I'm comparing the two together and they're basically the same and they give us pretty much the same answers. There's no real difference, certainly to maybe a rounding error, there's slight differences, but they basically give us the same answers. Um, so they're essentially mining the same data. That might not be the case if it uh, always. So we go rule explorer. 
basket underscore a rules. And it gives us this, oh, oops, sorry, I mustn't have built my model properly. This is why I shouldn't have done this live. I think this is a nice little tool. So we've passed in the transaction data that we wanted, and it actually allows us, it runs a priori for us, and it allows us to explore all these rules. So for example, we can do the minimum support here, and then, so let's move this around. Oops, why is that being slow? Oh, there we go, okay. So let's say 0.2 and then, Let's just drop the minimum confidence down to 0.5 and it's uh, minimum lift. We've got no minimum lift. Uh, where are our rules gone? Top rules. Oh, did I forget? Did I do the wrong thing? Hold on. I probably should have passed in. Oh no, Ugh, wrong thing. Sorry. My bad. Yeah, there's no rules in there. So it should be a priori. Uh, bring this up. There's a slight bug in this, I think, with the, the table. Uh, it should actually have a table over here to the left, and it just shows zero. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened there with that. Um, so let's say minimum support, minimum confidence minimum lift so we can start exploring all these rules give us a sec it's going to take a second so it gives us you know a bunch of things that we can plot being a bit slow probably should have rang this on the break Nick, i have a quick question while you're um yeah of course yeah, Shoot. Sorry, oh hey jess how are you yeah not Long too time no speak yeah, I've been I've been following these on um, not live the, the the YouTube. So oh wow okay yeah yeah I noticed uh, there was a few people watching it. Was that you? Yeah, you yeah the only one. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, just on the data table bit there, I just heard because I missed a bit the last le last uh, talk. And the, Shoot. The was that all done with the data table package? Or there's a pack? No, no. There's a package called DT capital D capital T. Yeah. Uh, it's the data table package in JavaScript rather than the R data table. Right. Okay. Great. So, and it, it gives you these. So, if you, yeah, just to show you while it's mining that up, uh, hold on. So, it gives you this kind of nice uh, JavaScript kind of interface like this. And you can search on things like, you know, 832, and it'll, it'll search through the table and filter them out. And it gives you a nice kind of JavaScript interface for it. That comes okay. from the that comes from a package called DT. Right. Uh, hold on, I'll show you how I coded that. It's this package here, library DT. Yeah. And then what you do is, if you when you're doing it with your R Markdown, you can just uh, pipe it into data table. Oh, That's okay, great. So you've you've done, you've yeah. put the person all the way to the last step. The, uh, it's a table. It's and it takes a table and it puts all the JavaScript niceness around it. Right. So and you, you can do a lot more stuff as well. You can. Use your own custom JavaScript and theming and formatting columns. There's a whole bunch of extra things you can do with it. I just haven't bothered. Yeah. Okay. No, that that's yeah. that's handy because I was concerned you'd have to do the whole code again through no, data table. Literally, just pipe it through data table and it'll do it for you. Now yeah. it'll only work. It'll only work with Markdown or Shiny or anything like that, though. It, obviously, yeah. It only works in a in a in a web environment. Yeah. Sure. That makes sense. All right. Right. So right. The okay. Next one. Yeah, so you can see here, there's a whole bunch of plots of scatter. So it's like, here's all the rules we have. We have a nice little interface and it's, you know, the confidence on the Y axis and the support on the others. So we can start looking at, you know, high support, higher support versus higher confidence and all this. And it just gives us these introspect. We can obviously change it so we can do any of these that we want. This is a great thing. We can look at like lift, lift versus support and it will replot for us. Gives us these nice little um, overviews like, uh, tool tips so we can start investigating i think that's kind of nice and you can plot the color 
you can change your colors. So it's just a nice little kind of in, um, exploration tool for this thing. The thing that kind of piqued my interest, oh, and we can export it as well. I'm not sure what that does. I haven't actually used that, but I think if you've found a bunch of rules you want, you can presume it. Actually, let's 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 try it, see what it does. Uh, so I'm gonna say this locally, see what it gives us. Oops. So temp. So it's given us a CSV file. And let's see what's in that CSV file. I haven't actually looked at that, so. Oh, so it's just given us yeah the output of you know the tech, what the support of the rule is, the confidence, yeah, stuff we had from the other thing. It just gives us all that list. So that's handy if you want to use it for something else. Okay, so yeah, handy for that. The thing that really got me interested though was this graph. So what they've done is they've taken the items and the association rules associated with those items. And they've created a graph of it. So you can see here as we move in, let's just zoom in a bit. We can see we have a whole load of rules here and then we have the items. So we can see as the items are pointing at rules and then the, you know, so essentially you never have items connected together. The items are only ever connected through rules and it's a directed graph. So I had the idea of, well, we could kind of use our association rules. We can use, convert all this idea to a graph. And I had this idea for graph analysis earlier, but it kind of got very messy because basically my logic was if I take an item and then I can create a graph and basically create an edge between the two items if they occur on a, on a, in a transaction together and then like have a count, you can have the strength of the relationship through the count and then put everything on the graph. It got a bit big though, quite quickly. Um, and that would be fine, but it then became like an engineering problem and I'd have to work about optimizing it. And what I'm really trying to do here is just try and get some, not quick wins is a terrible word, but just can I get decent bang for buck? So I thought, well, actually what I could do is I kind of have a graph pre-built here. So what I can do is I can basically look at, and these are all completely disjoint from one another as well. So if I ignore all the rules, because I don't really care about the rules too much, right? They're all just different combinations of different things. But what I can do is just basically look at these disjoint clusters and then essentially all of these become like a cluster together, like a co-occurring cluster. And they're kind of, it's automatically, it's automatically being kind of filtered for importance. I don't want to say significance because that gets misused, but it's automatically being filtered because there's an association rules built on that. And we've kind of filtered them out by our minimum support and our minimum confidence and stuff. So why not just use this? So that's basically what was the idea I had. So the first thing I did was, and I'm just looking at 30 of them here. We can, you know, obviously we can add more. So as we start adding things in here, it'll just add more to the plot. So, you know, we feel, and as you can see, you start getting, things get a little bit more uh, interacted and, and, you know, these probably would have been disjoint in the past, but now they're kind of, there's multiple clusters here. So I was thinking we can essentially convert the out, because one of the things I didn't have a good feel for is this is all very great. It's like when you run a clustering algorithm on a bunch of data, it's like, well, what the hell do I do now? You've got to go through a whole lot of work of like inspecting the clusters and putting narratives on them and, and all that kind of stuff. And I was kind of thinking something similar here. So rather than doing that too much and, and also trying to make sure it was like valid for some, some definition of valid. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna kind of use these disjoint clusters and just use my kind of graph technology because I've given a workshop in the past on, you know, using graphs and some basic kind of graph theory. So we have a bunch of like disjoint clusters here. Get rid of all the association rules, don't really care about them, but just keep the elements of each of these like disjoint graphs and just keep the products in them. So that's basically what I did. So we have this as well. I mean, obviously we can use this, but then it kind of prompted this idea and I was like, oh, we can use graphs. So how can I do that? Because obviously this was something they'd done there, but there is a thing called, in a thing called A Rules Explorer, or sorry, A Rules Viz, uh, as in visualization, we can actually plot it. So I've got my 
association rules here, and let me just make this a bit bigger for the, for the purposes of the, the screen. But we can plot it, but rather than actually plotting the graph, because we don't particularly care, let me just make it a little bit smaller. Uh, we can just kind of capture the output as a graph. So that's basically what I did. So I it was a bit of jiggery pokery, which, you know, I had the good sense not to try and do live. Um, but, you know, you create this and then you just collect it as an I, which is a standard graphing library that's in both R and Python. So essentially what we've done is we've now got an object, which is that graph we just saw in Rule Explorer. And we're just keeping, you know, a thousand entries because I can't remember how many there was in there. So now that we've got the graphs we can, and we can plot it, so you can see we had it there, which we kind of had in the previous one, but I wanted to try and do it again. So as I scroll down, we have kind of these graphs here. And then we can, you know, this is like the JavaScript that we had before, which has the gives us the benefits of the pop-ups and stuff. We can in inspect the rules and look at what they do. It gives us all this. But now we can actually do stuff from a programmatic point of view with the graph data. So what I what I did was without without really getting into the details too long and too much. So uh, sorry, this the thing here. I was looking at the connected components. So basically, I'm just trying to pull out all these disjoint areas. And then I'm filtering out, when you look through the data here, I basically filter out uh, RNA as support. So basically, if, if, um, I, if, if it's an association rule, it has support and confidence and all that. If it's a product item, it doesn't. So I'm just keeping the ones where support is NA. And those are just the elements of that cluster of the, that graph component that is items. And then everything in that disjoint cluster, uh, disjoint graph gets associated together, gets grouped together. And that's basically what I did. Now, the problem with that, though, is that you, what happens very quickly, I was, I was just using, excuse me, disconnected ones first. But the problem is that we end up with a very big um, cluster. We, we, one group is very big. So this is the output here. So what I've done here is there's a, uh, I've taken these are our like IDs. So we have 19 entries. Let me just change the data table here. So you see some of them have very small. I've gotten rid of anything that's of size one or two or whatever. Um, and we've got different sizes here. And these are all our, so all of these are kind of in the same group, grouping. And now we've got this very rudimentary product grouping of items that tend to co-occur together. Okay. Now, our problem is we've got this big, huge thing up here which is 61 items long. So I thought yeah, that's a bit too big to really be useful. I, I like the idea of having these little groups that are very small in size. Now, some of them seem a bit incredibly uninformed. Like these aren't going to tell as much because it's three values in a row. They all co-occur together. You know, they are probably all the same item that, you know, I'm not going to be revealing the secrets of Fatima if I tell anyone, any stakeholders about this kind of stuff. This is going to be, you know, not particularly interesting, but, you know, it's good to know, put them in there. So the end, the other thing I did was because we had a graph, there are some cluster graphs that we can keep. So what I'm doing here is this is just some table graph stuff that this is our code. Don't worry about it. But basically what I'm looking at is there's a there's a clustering algorithm called edge between this, which basically creates it tries to create. Areas of the graph that are kind of highly connected to one another, but then weakly connected to other parts of the graph. And it tries to identify those. And that's basically what I did. So when I did that and combined it with the other one, I'd essentially broken it all down. So this is the, you can see there was 61 product groups in this new value and I've broken them now. Now we have a 14 and a 15 size, still a little bit big, but much better than we were before. And now we can group all these together. So I've just kind of put them together Oh, this is, I couldn't actually get this to work. So there is a thing called Viz Network to produce. I couldn't get it to work in the code. So what I'm going to do is I will post it here. So I am very conscious that this is a bit messy. Oh, no, I, I need to rebuild this Docker package. That's a couple of things now that didn't work. So Viz Network. Um, um, and I, I was telling people about this. I kind of, had a little bit of a dilemma whether how clean I would make this because I'm conscious it's this is a bit messy but the whole point of this was to show a real project and all the issues 
Now, the one thing I, I spared you from is some of the Googling I've had to do, although I will probably talk about that a bit more in the next one, especially when it comes to buy till you die. There was a little bit of it here, but I also kind of wanted to convey the idea that this isn't nearly as clean and, you know, ambiguity free as a lot of people, when you get these polished presentations of the results and there's all this, you know, confidence in the outcomes, the reality of it is the swan beneath the surface of the water, you know, they're paddling like crazy, even though it's very graceful above. Um, so there is an element of that definitely with all this. It's, it's not nearly as, it is messy and expect to have to go down some blind alleys. So let me just run this and see what you get because the Viz network is, oh, what the hell happened? Do I have to, no, okay, hold on. Viz network. And let's try that one more time. There we go. Let's pop her out. Oh, this takes a little while to run. I remember that as well. So as we're doing that, I will I will check this out. So yeah, so we end up with a bunch of groups. So I was to do is just check the validity because I was very conscious that we're going to clusters, but you know how how common does this mean? So again, I don't know how useful this is. This was me kind of just checking for myself. So I'm combining the two groups into a single table. Um, I'm, I'm going to get rid of the one that has 61 on it. And then what I'm looking here is I look at the clusters and I look at all the all the all the transactions that feature any elements in the grouping. And what I wanted to look at was how commonly what proportion of items are in there. And I have you can see I have 10 and this will give us our items. So, you know, if we have we have 10 items in this group, but they tend to be it, what this is basically telling you is that most of the transactions that feature any items from that group have a relatively low proportion of occurrence. So rather than having them, whereas over here, like for example, uh, in this one here, all four, it has five groups. And when any of them occur, all five of them tend to occur, co-occur together. So it's kind of like a relative strength how often do these product groups co-occur together? Kind of like what we were talking about before with Lyft. I've no idea if this is any useful, but this was something I was trying to capture in my head. Okay, I've got a bunch of product groupings. How valid are those groups? And then, then the other thing I wanted to do was, let's just put them in together. So we have a bunch of product codes together. They're not particularly insightful. So let's, again, going back to Des, the data table, I just piped it into a data table so we can inspect it. So let's say we go to like 50 rows so we can look at it here. The great thing about this is we can put in a product name. So let's say all 02 and just look at them all. So we can see here all these uh, stock codes come together. So it's all like polka dot bowls, green and blue, and cups and plates. So bowls, cups, and plates of all the different colors and they all tend to co-occur, but typically only like two or three of them at a time. So I guess that kind of makes sense. They'd be bought as a set. That's not necessarily particularly useful. And this goes back to my point of, the, one of the weaknesses with this data set is because we don't have that hierarchy, it would be really, really nice if we had a couple of extra columns where you know we had a, an overall product type and then a subtype for the different colors that kind of stuff so that we could naturally tease out these hierarchies and maybe even collapse them down so that we don't necessarily care if a green and a blue, we just care that it's a polka dot ball. And you can see here, this goes back to the point I mentioned earlier about how the, the free text descriptions are often unique or if they're not unique, they're pretty close together. So that's kind of what I've done. You can see like pink polka dot plate, pink spotty plate, pink polka dot plate. Why isn't that the same? It's a bit weird. I would have thought those two seem to be the same. Maybe I've misspelled it or something. So yeah, so we're, we're, we now have essentially, after all of this, we now have a product grouping. So we have, I don't know how many products are in it. Uh, that's one thing I haven't actually checked. Oh no, we can add it all up. There's about, um, be on this list here. So what's the total? We have uh, about 200, I think. No, that can't be 200. That's less than that. There's 200 in the other one. There's maybe 100 there. Just doing a quick eyeballing. 
So we've got a grouping of about 100 of the products that we've looked at. Um, so, but like I said, we restricted the product grouping to 0.8. So we were only looking for really strong co-occurrences. So the next thing that struck me to do was, well, let's re basically, let's redo this exercise. And we wrote them out by the way, because this could be useful later. So I wrote all this out later on. Um, and basically later on, if in other work, it might be useful to just be able to assign like a cluster ID to each product and maybe group by or, or have some kind of, you know, grouping so that we can do some aggregated modeling later on, rather than on an individual level. That could be something useful for either buy till you die or, or maybe some time series analysis. But then we went on to the lower support rules. So instead of having um, uh, the lower support, where did that go? No repeater analysis. Uh, did I forget to put the cursor? Would it be? Yes. So uh, Neil, that's that was the other thing I thought about. Um, sorry, uh, would it be possible to extract features from descriptions? That is the next thing I was thinking about doing is essentially doing some kind of like word to vec on the descriptions and seeing if there is something we can get from that. Now, the descriptions are very, very sparse. So I'm not sure how effective it would be. But yes, that is absolutely something I might do. And I might even do it later on. I'm very conscious, as you can see, you kind of go down the rabbit hole. And it, the old joke is these projects can become fractal very quickly, where no matter how much you explore, you just end up finding more areas to explore. So I am conscious that in the real world as well, you have limited time for this. So I don't know if I would have time for that, but that is definitely something I might do in my own time that might, I might revisit this data set. One thing I've found fascinating about this project is even this relatively simple data set has created quite a few opportunities for looking at the data in very different ways which I didn't expect at the start, especially when it's so simple. Like there's, there's not an awful lot to it. There's, you know, it's a transaction code, trans a stock code. And, and uh, by the way, none of this involves prices. So we haven't looked at prices or like, if you buy 10 of these, do you tend to buy one of the other? So there's nothing about relative frequencies. All we're looking at here is literally co-occurrence. So that's the other thing it might be interesting to do. And that will be something potentially we could do with the graph theory if we, if we do more direct graph theory or like Neil suggested with some crude NLP, that's definitely something I'm thinking about doing. Uh, I, I haven't yet. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm very conscious I could, I didn't really plan it this way, but I could very easily have a year's worth of talks on this stuff, just from all these ideas and exploring them uh, and not really go into modeling much at all, just purely, you know, looking at the data in different ways. Um, so I probably won't for this project, like, sorry, for this series of workshops, but you might find code for it in the repos, you know, before this is all over, even if I don't necessarily talk about it in this series. So, um, yeah, we're trying to repeat, where is, I must have done it earlier. So I, I definitely did it with a lower support. So I went to point eight. I'll just see where my code was. I thought it was down there, but maybe I let out. Oh, yeah, that's the one thing I hate about these. It kind of takes over the scroll bar when you're trying to scroll up. Uh, I try, oh yeah, so I did it here. So basically I did the exact same thing, but you can see the confidence is 0.4 instead of 0.8. So we now end up with 5,000 rules instead of like 423. So you can see it's not a linear response because you know obviously the, the more you lower the confidence, the more the transactions become available. So basically we repeated the exercise and we just ended up with more, more things together. Uh, oh, I haven't really put the output in that yet. Um, I haven't plotted. That has been a bit, oh no, it has. Uh, so this is the top 50 rules. So yeah, we can see we have uh, the distinct subgraphs. We're doing the exact same thing. There's now a lot more in it. So actually, what well, for I end, because I'm conscious of time, let's just go to a basket. Uh, basket lower hey rules. Uh, no, basket lower rules. There we go. Basket lower rules. Sorry, a priori. 
what do I call it? Nope, hold on. So it's uh, basket lower. That is not right, is it? Maybe I did basket lower rules. Okay, basket lower rules. Let's just use rule explorer on this. So right. I must have changed my naming convention, which you know is one of those things I tell people not to do and then do it myself. But it's the age old maxim of do as I say, not as I do. So if we, yeah. all right, so let's go to rule explorer. God damn it. Oh, damn it. So there's a lot more rules to mine in this. Uh, there's like 5,000, but you know, we'll get these nice pretty graphs again and uh, we can create some plots, but that might give us, you know, something that isn't directly relevant in terms of, yeah, because we've got the minimum confidence there. Let's just look at the graph. Going to take a little while to chug through. We've got, you know, 4,000. Yeah, there's some bug. This used to work, I think, in earlier versions of Rule Explorer, but I think something's changed and it's just incompatibilities between the two. So some, some kind of filtering isn't being done that should be getting done. So we should be seeing all these rules here. And I think there's just a bug in the code or maybe I need to put something in there. So now we can see the graph. So we can look at the top rules. Let's, let's put in, a, let's look at a few thousand of them. And zoom, yeah, that's going to take a little while to chug through. Oh. So yeah, we can see we've got all these little clusters. Some of them are very small and they're not doing much for us. But some of them are quite big and they're, you know, we're going to essentially take some of these smaller ones. We get rid of a lot of the ones that have only one or two items in them because I figure they're not particularly interesting. Um, but then we just repeat the answer and then we get another set of groupings, presumably similar to what we would have had before, but with more items and more data in it. And then we can start reporting on that, looking at the lift and stuff. And I think this will be more insightful because, like I said, if the support for this is 0.4, it basically means these things only co-occur 40% of the time together. So that is something that people are less likely to have noticed. Whereas if you've got a much higher support, while the strength of the signal is much higher, they're also a lot more obvious. So it's just less useful. Um, yeah, and we can play around with that. And all of this code is in the repo. I, I, if any of you want to have a crack at it, by all means, have a go. Uh, I'm conscious of the time though. It's about 10, uh, it's coming up to 10 to nine. So that is a good place to spot, but that's basically where we are with association rules. So that's what they do. It gives you a bunch of co-occurring rules and it allows you to kind of filter them. Actually, one thing I will show is the best rules lift. So if we go a priori uh, low rules and then table, should have them there. No, where are they? Sorry, I've chewed up all the memory in this machine. So where are the lower support rules? So it's up here, reducing the minimum confidence. There we go. So uh, yeah, basket lower rules dot table. There we go. Basket. Lower rules. Let's go to Because I just realized I hadn't actually shown you this. So you can see here now, we just have a lift of all the various rules that are suggesting. You can see a lot of these are kind of suggesting the same items in different combinations with very high confidence. And, you know, the support means basically there's a very low number of these. So that's one thing to do when you're doing these rules is just there that if you have an awful lot of transactions, you may need to have a very low support as the input because items that just aren't in the transactions will be filtered out if the, if, if, the, if the proportion they appear in transactions is lower than the support. So that's something to just be aware of. But you can see you've got all these very high lift numbers, but because we've got very high confidence, 
they're not particularly interesting. Whereas if we filter out and look at, say, confidence less than, say, 0.6, Now we're, we're not, or let's say even 0.4, uh, let's say 0.45, right? We can still see a relatively high lift. So what's happening is the presence of one is implying the presence of the other, but it's just not as common as it would be. So in many cases, these are all kind of core, they're, you know, they're beside each other in, in, in ID. So therefore they're probably likely to be very related. Um, but that might be, you know, that's something we can start digging out and start looking at the non-obvious looks. So one way off the top of my head might be to just, because we have this support ID and it's all sequential, we could convert these to a new, get rid of any letters, drop the numeric and just do differences and, and then get rid of anything that's within like the number like five from one another and look at those rules. And those might be of interest then, right? Actually, that might be something I will talk about next time but i'm going to leave it there like i said this is what association rules do they're very very simple there's not an awful lot of underlying theory to learn and there isn't an awful lot of like science stuff to learn how to use them but i find they're quite interesting and there's quite a lot you can do with them even from that kind of basic stuff that we've been looking at and um but next next month when or not next month um in the next workshop will be almost certainly be july because uh, I'm like I said, I'm hoping to have a talk in June. Um, we will have basically I'm moving on now from here to what are called buy till you die models, which is more of a model like probabilistic modeling, um, like fitting parameters and stuff. And I will basically give those the same treatment as this. Um, see what we discovered. It's given me some weird answers, certainly on the dropout part. Uh, which I don't really understand, and I'm not sure if it's the data or if I'm just doing it wrong. Um, so I hopefully will have that resolved by the next time we give a workshop, and I will explain my difficulties with that because, again, using techniques is sometimes a problem that you will encounter. And have I figure it's useful going through the process I tend to do to try and resolve those issues. But that's pretty much where we are. I'm going to leave it there. Um, it's about eight minutes to nine, so it's a good place to stop. But before I do that, and before I stop the recording, does anyone have any like questions for me? Or is there anything I didn't explain particularly well? Or is there anything you would like me to go over? Now, now is the time or forever hold your peace. Actually, that's a joke. Just send me an email. Anyone got any questions? No, okay. Well, thank you very much. We're gonna leave it there. I'm gonna stop the recording now shortly. And if there's anyone who would like to ask me questions after I do the recording, I totally understand that as well. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna leave it there. And I hope to see you back on the workshop in July, possibly June if the talk falls through, but my gut feeling is it'll happen. So it will probably be July and August, at which point I'll hope to kind of wrap it up. So my idea is to have the next workshop I'll be covering by till you die models and then the final workshop will be about kind of wrapping up the project and displaying results to stakeholders and overall conclusions and analysis. That's, you know, an important part of any of these projects. But uh, other than that, thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording now. And if any of you have any questions, feel free to hold on. And if not, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you all soon. How do I stop the recording again? Give me, I think it just hit stop up here, is it? Yeah, there we go.